welcome to Micro Live. In the next hour, we'll be attempting to transfer software from America by an electronic mail system, a fairly dodgy thing to do on live television. We'll be examining the advantages and disadvantages of basic code, which attempts to send a single program to a wide range of micros. And we're meeting a graphic lady from New York who seldom puts pen to paper. John Cole joins us once again, this time with some good advice for anyone thinking of buying a modem. Good morning, John. Good morning, Mac. I'm going to show you a range of modems, pick out some of the best buys, and tell you why it's illegal to connect some of them to the telephone system. And remembering what happened last time we used a modem on live television, we investigate the secretive world of the computer hacker. It's quite fun. It's a, get a great feeling of beating the system if you're there with a the little tiny computer and uh, huge great mainframes chugging away somewhere else in the country and you're in at the top level. Being you've outwitted the people who designed it. And later, we'll be announcing the winners of the software competition for schools that was launched during the last edition of Micro Live. The winners of the regional heats are waiting expectantly and somewhat nervously in the audience. They come from schools all over the country, hoping to win one of the top three prizes, between them worth over £10,000, which they can spend on a range of computer equipment from monitors to disk drives or software. The managing director of BBC Television, Bill Cotton, will be along about quarter to one to make the presentations. Well, in October of this year, we'll be starting a new magazine programme. It'll keep up to date with what's happening, and the guy with the very best job in the whole show reporting to us from the US is someone we first met behind the scenes at the Chicago Robotics Convention last year. One of the most popular exhibits was on the Westinghouse Corporation stand, where a number of industrial robots performed a state show with an actor. Good afternoon. Ma Not now. We have an audience out here. Can't you see all these people? Now, aren't you embarrassed? Sensitive artist. All right, I'm sorry I yelled at you. You forgive me? All right, I'm going to start the show now. Each robot has its own microcomputer, and these are linked together so that one micro can send start and stop commands to the others. All right, be neat now. Of course, leaving all the timing to the computers would have left no time for the actor to improvise. So from time to time, the robots are programmed to wait for a cue from somebody pressing a button backstage. Now comes the tricky part. They wanted me to sit in the chair, and I said, find yourself another dummy. Besides the mechanical actions, the music is computer controlled as well. Much of the design for the show was created here in Brooklyn, a part of New York City, by a man living on the first floor of a quiet suburban house known as the Frog Palace. His name is Freff. He's an artist, musician, and journalist who's trained as a clown, drawn comic books, and written everything from science fiction to articles for serious computer magazines. Doing that show with the robots was a lot of fun. I mean, what else can you call it? Getting a chance to take three great, huge, hulking industrial robots, each worth about $50,000, and teach them to do silly things like wave cardboard hats in the air and sing Sweet Adeline. Of course, the practical work of getting them to do those silly things was quite enormous. It took us six weeks of design and programming. I was involved in that programming, but I'm not a computer professional. I'm a professional who uses computers in the things that I do for a living. First use I found for it was in word processing for my writing. I bought this apple four years ago on the strength of a friend's recommendation. Now, all I'd ever seen microcomputers do before was play games, and I found that very boring. But he put a word processing program in, and I sat down to work, and in two weeks, I'd written what normally takes me six weeks. Well, needless to say, I was hooked. So I've been using it ever since. I've written, in fact, about two million words of articles in the last four years on this machine. And they, in turn, led me to my next great love with computers, which is music. This drum machine is a very sophisticated computer all by itself. So is this synthesizer. And you can take these two units, tie them together with the Apple II in an interface, 
and have kind of a mini recording studio. It's amazing how the different worlds of computing I've explored come together sometimes. I wrote an article about synthesizer interfaces for computers, and I got a call from someone who wanted to ask me some questions. He was a classical guitarist who had gotten interested in computers, and as it happens, he was also a guitarist that I had wanted to take lessons from just two years before, but I couldn't afford him. Well, now I am taking guitar lessons, and I'm giving him computer lessons in exchange. Another thing I like about computers is art, what computer people call graphics for some reason. And that's one reason I'm very interested in this machine that's come in today. It's a BBC microcomputer, and its different screen modes excite me tremendously. I'm looking forward to examining it and exploring it. British machines had a major impact in the American marketplace a couple of years ago with the Sinclair ZX81, which broke the price barrier. But serious micros, like the BBC Micro, have just come into the marketplace, and it's too early to tell what impact they're going to have. The most interesting thing I've had a chance to fool with in graphics lately is ultra-high resolution. This board in the Apple has on it a 16-bit second processor dedicated solely to graphics. Now, because it's a 16-bit processor, it can access a lot more memory. There's 128K of RAM on the board itself and create pictures of greater complexity, more colors, and generally more interest. I've only started to work with it myself, but there are people in New York who've taken it very much further. And we'll be seeing a girl who does just that later on in the show. But first, I'd like to ask the audience, how many of you got a micro at home? Oh, just about everyone. That's not surprising, is it? How many of you use them for games? Just about everybody. How many of you use them for something other than games? W what do you use yours for? Programming, maybe. What for? Well, uh, utilities, that sort of thing. Do, do you go in for competitions apart from the one you're in at the moment? Um, not often. Do you make any practical use of it? Um, not really, apart from the stage lighting. That we've done. Does anybody use it apart from just writing your own programs? Richard? Well, plenty of word processing, Mac. Uh, very useful for that. If you write articles, books, and so on, very useful indeed. How many have got it connected up to the telephone network? Most of the people over here, what do you use it for? Messaging, electronic mailbox. Um, it's very convenient. It's better than having a telephone answering machine. Who else uses it for anything else? Do you, does anybody use it for home accounting, for example? What, what do you use it for? Balancing my checkbook. You don't trust the banks? Not in America. Ah. <laughs> Nobody in England uses it for keeping control over their accounts? No. No bit at all. Right, well, one of the real growth areas for use of the Maho Micro is communicating with the outside world. And that means using a micro to send and receive information as a series of bleeps which travel down the telephone line. One US electronic mail company claims to be growing at the rate of 10,000 subscribers a month. But some people even think that a micro without a telecoms link is little more than an interesting toy, and that includes me. John, if you want to link up your micro to the telephone, what does it cost and what equipment is available today? OK, Mac, we've got a whole range of equipment here, really into two groups, uh, acoustic couplers, which we've showed you many times before, and modems. The acoustic couplers are nice because you can plug an ordinary telephone handset in there, uh, no matter where you are, and plug that into the computer. But uh, not very reliable. If You can get some noise uh, in very noisy situations. And that will give you errors coming through. It might do, yeah. but if you're travelling, it's really ideal. On the other hand, most systems use modems, and here we've got a Spectrum connected through the VTX5000 modem to Prestel, and that's running at 1200 Bode, so the information comes down quite rapidly. That's at about 120 characters a second, yes. and I presume it'll send it at 75 Bode, that's seven and a half when you're typing on the it's keyboard. It's quite a slow channel back, so when you type on the keyboard, the information can only get back slowly. But that costs about £84, works very well. Ideal way of connecting to Prestel. Quite a high cost when compared with the cost of the micro itself, isn't it? It is, yes. Mm -hmm. We've got some cheaper modems, though, down the line. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a nice system here. This is CompuNet, which is a new service, really the first alternative to Prestel. And this has got its own modem here, and you can buy the modem and the software for £100. That provides a whole range of services, like shopping and banking and messaging and so on. A, a really good alternative, also working at 1200 Bode. 
It's quite a good system. There's a thing called jungle on that, which I quite like the <laughs> idea of. And you've got to be very careful. You can go in there and get your hand bitten off, as far as I can make out. <laughs> yes. This is another system over here. It's called a bulletin board system, and we've got an Atari connected through. Now, the I keep here. hearing about bulletin boards. What are they? They're systems run by individuals at home offering their own computer so that people can dial into that and pick up information from that computer or leave messages on that computer. So you need an auto-response modem to, to do that, to run a bulletin board yourself? Yes, you do. How many of them are there? There are a hundred or so in the UK and thousands and thousands in the States. Quite incredible. What on earth do they do? <laughs> what do they use them oh, for? Oh, you'd be amazed. <laughs> um, there are religious bulletin boards, there are dating boards, there are a few political boards and there are an awful lot of computer boards for people who are interested in computing. So you can get on and get a prayer sent down to you at 1200 Bode? Any time you need at 1200 Bode. It's marvellous. Well, actually not at 1200 Bode. This one's running at 300 Bode and most of the bulletin boards do run at 300 Bode. So That's 30 characters a second. Yeah. Right, and you'll see on the screen it's somewhat slower. This is in fact the London bulletin board and offers a wide range of services. Mm -hmm. Only one person at a time can get in. We've got a simple modem here called a buzz box, really quite cheap and that could work with a whole range of computers. Over here, we've got the BBC computer connected to Telecom Gold through very secret accounts that we won't tell you about, and it's connected through this modem, the Minor Miracles modem, uh, which is a very nice one because it will run at 300 baud and at 1200 baud. So you can get into the bulletin boards as well as getting into Prestel services if you've got the right terminal emulation software, that's the right software to enable the computer to display the right messages on the screen. How do you get information from all this? How do you find bulletin boards? How do you find out how to get right. onto a There are lots network? and lots of published lists and once, for example, in magazines like Personal Computer World, there are a couple of pages devoted to telephone numbers. Once you get onto one board, you'll find indexes of other boards and as I say, there are thousands and thousands. Now there's a whole range of modems and of course choosing which one you want is very difficult. Um, they vary from extremely cheap ones, uh, like this, which is in fact a kit. It's a Maplin kit. Uh, and if I show you the inside, you'll see that it's actually quite complicated. So you wouldn't build that uh, unless you knew what you were doing. The other problem with this one, though it only costs £50, is that it's actually illegal to connect it onto the telephone system. So what all the thousands of people that are buying them are doing with them, I have absolutely no idea. That's what this little sticker means, which says prohibited on it. You know, it's illegal, you can't use it. It is, and that one will never get telecom approval because it's built by individuals. There are some cheap... The reasons for that, are presumably, is to they don't want electricity going back down the line and electrocuting yes. telecoms engineers. If the thing's made badly, it could damage the, the whole exchange equipment. So it's quite important. Moving up market a bit, or moving right up to the other end, we've got this machine here. Now, this one is not a home and hobbyist machine. It costs about £500, and it offers connection at 1200 Bode in both directions. Um, but that's a professional modem. All the others on this uh, desk are amateur ones, and they offer a range of facilities. You have to look very carefully when you're buying a modem. You must make quite sure that it'll work at the right speeds for the service you want. Make quite sure it plugs into the computer, because not all modems plug into all computers. And you may well want auto-dialing facilities, so that you can dial out, or the computer dials out for you. You don't have to do it yourself. And you might, if you're running a bulletin board, want it to auto-answer. And after you've selected from that, it's a question of cost. But you can get some quite respectable things, about £80. It almost seems to me a nuisance. You have to have boxes that are varying in size from this one to this one to this one, as well as your computer, but some are already built in as well. Yes, that's right. This modem here, in fact, is out of a computer, and the boards fit together like that, and it plugs inside the computer. Very nice indeed. So that keeps the whole thing smaller if it's on your desk, for example, yes. or in your study. Excellent. Well, if you do decide to buy a modem, it's just one more piece of equipment that might go wrong. This is a dead modem, I think. One of the interesting aspects of the BBC Micro is its capacity for electronic mail. Well, I want to experiment with it, so they sent me a modem and a cable and terminal emulation software and instructions. And I put it all together, and it doesn't work. Well, if you've done things with microcomputers, you know that sometimes they don't work, and when that happens, it's very frustrating because you can't exactly tell what's wrong. It could be the modem. It could be the cable, since it came like this. Could be the instructions, it could be the software, or it could be the computer itself. In any case, by the time you see me, I hope I'll be online and I can talk to you. Hello, Frav. Greetings, Mac. Our oh, greetings. I'm sorry to get you out of bed so early in New York. It must be wonderful there. Well, it's uh, not too hot yet. It's still cool this morning. The sun rose a little while ago and it was gorgeous. We're having a similar sort of day here in London, at least it was when I came in the studio. Well, have you got a bit... What went wrong with your equipment that time? 
Well, as, as a matter of fact, uh, two things went wrong. The modem was bad and the cable was bad. We had to replace both of them, and when that was done, it, it worked beautifully. I spent the last several weeks uh, enjoying electronic mail, studying it, learning how it works, uh, sending messages to various places around the world. I'm having a great time. Who have you been sending them to apart from us here in the BBC? Well, there's a lot of people in the music industry who are using dial comp to uh, keep track of things. The touring musician can take a little Radio Shack 100 or, or one of the net computers and plug into any phone anywhere, Paris, Japan, any place, and keep in touch with his agent, his booking managers, uh, his suppliers, uh, tour people, uh, friends. It's uh, very convenient for us. Okay, well, let's see it all work. Why not send it down? All right, I have got a program here that I loaded. All I have to do is hit return. It's coming from me to you right now. It's arrived. Oh, there it is. It's arrived. That was very rapid. Thanks a lot, Fred. We'll hear from you later. It's a pleasure. All right, let's download that program and uh, save it onto disk. So I'll save it on disk as a file called Fref. And now read it, and we're all set. So let's see what he sent us. No, I got that wrong. Uh, read that. All right, here it comes. Right, he sent us a computer program. A nibble from across the water, I like that. <laughs> <laughs> nice. I used this system when I was in Hong Kong because I left some software behind in London. And uh, it's very, very easy to get somebody to in London, sort the mail out, put it up on the mailbox, and then you can pull it down a matter of minutes later. So it's quite a viable way of moving software around. And it's not error corrector, though. You can get mistakes coming it's, through. It's Do you not send error it through correct. a couple of times or something like that? No, it, it usually works once, and, you know, fingers crossed. In rehearsals, we mucked it up, but we might get it right this time. <laughs> um, right, let's stop that. I've got that down, saved it on disk. I'll just disconnect from Telecom Gold, log off there, and now come back to the BBC computer and load that program in and we will discover whether or not we've got it without errors. So there it is coming in from the disk, I've just saved it on, into the system, and try run. And it says mistake at line 1420. Well, that doesn't worry me too much, because at line 1420, he's got color, X, C-O-L-O-R, which is the American way of spelling it. He's using it on a, an American version of the Beeb machine. So if I alter that, and let's now pray, yes. Success. You see, you don't need error correction, Mac. It works. <laughs> oh, that's beautiful. Hi, there's some bites from the Big Apple. <laughs> well, thanks a lot, John, and thanks also to Pref. We'll be seeing later on. Well, last time John used a modem on live television show, something rather unexpected happened. We set up a special electronic mailbox for the program, and a hacker, that's somebody who breaks into other people's computers, had discovered or guessed our password. We don't know exactly how, and left a message that was triggered when John logged on. Right. British Telecom Gold, we're through. We now have to type in our identification, which we said our ID was OWL001. And the machine asks what our password is, so no cameras on the keyboard, please. The password is that. And Telecom Gold, Automated Office Services, we're through. Mail call... Ah, <laughs> computer security error. I think Illegal we have access. some hackers. I think you've tempted some hackers <laughs> rather too well. Uh, illegal access. I hope your television program runs as smoothly as my program worked out your passwords. Nothing is secure. <laughs> Hacker song. Put Fine. another password in, <laughs> vomit out, and try again. Try to get past logging in. We're hacking, hacking, hacking. <laughs> That's brilliant. All try right. his first wife's maiden name. This is more than just a game. It's real fun, but just the same. It's <laughs> hacking, 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 yes. Yeah, well, oh, no, no. ACN019, hi there, Alex, from Oz and Yug. Now, look, Oz and Yug, just go away, will you? We want to do a demonstration here. Go away. <laughs> I remember it well. Well, we were breaking the first rule of computer security with that mailbox because our password was only two characters long, and that was to make it easy for John to remember it in the heat of a live television show. But it also made life very easy for a determined hacker. Since then, Telecom Gold tell us they've increased the security of their system in three ways. They are now only give you three attempts to get on before you're disconnected, and they also monitor frequent attempts at the same mailbox and trace the call. And from last Friday, you have to have a password of at least six characters. But hacking is a very controversial subject and it affects all of us. If computers are easy to break into, then hackers are gaining access to private or secret information that may concern you. The hacker's equipment is simple. A telephone, a modem, and a computer or two. Jeremy San, an ex-hacker, explains the joy of hacks. There's an, uh, an excitement in breaking into a security system, breaking into a mailbox or a, a company. It's interesting to be able to break in and no damage is done once you're there. 
Protecting data from physical harm is easy enough. Protecting it from the hacker may be more difficult. What sort of computer systems are most vulnerable to attack by the hackers? Well, certainly the ones that allow access uh, over the public switch telephone network to anybody who knows the number of the computer. In, in that kind of system, all you need to have in general is a password. That password may be very simple indeed. It's not necessarily difficult to learn one. You may learn one from a friend, poison board. It's not even necessarily very difficult to find one. You can make a small computer run through a whole series of likely combinations, and if you're looking at, say, a two or three letter password, you don't have to go through too many before you hit one. I can demonstrate how fiendishly simple it is to get into a computer uh, by showing you, uh, just for an example, the AGB, which is Audits of Great Britain, which is a fairly large computer located in central London which has a lot of television audience research data on it. So now I'm in as one user, Granada Reports, and uh, charging money to their bill every minute I'm on. The system's got a, a mailing user-to-user -user type message handling service on it. Now if I look at the directory there, um, I can look up and see who I am. If I'm Granada Reports, that's under 16. And there's a night of reports. And uh, if you want to try something else, you might as well try the next one, which is uh, looks like an advertising agency with an account number of 110207. With Granada, they had the password of um, 1999 on the end of that. So the chances are that Granfield, Walk and Collins will have a password of 0207 on the end of that. So if we just um, need the system, we can. Um, in again and see if the, uh, they've left the password as something as simple as the last four digits of their account. Now, if you use the user number, it's the one we saw, which is 110207, and I think the password might be 0207, so we'll just try it. And we're in. As easy as that? As easy as that. Is, is that now costing that company it's money? Now, it's now starting to uh, accumulate time charges of possibly 5, 10p a minute. Then as soon as I start to look at the expensive pages, it'll cost them even more. So you're really now stealing from that company? Um, it's effectively charging money for the services they're not going to receive. It's not the, I don't think it's the same as breaking and entering. You do no damage. If people are prepared for that kind of information, which is so simple to get into, it's partly their own fault. An insurance company won't pay insurance if you leave the door unlocked. And the users of systems like these do sometimes leave the door unlocked. To the hackers, the only cost is their huge telephone bills. But are they risking more? What does the law say about hacking? Who knows? I certainly don't. I think it probably falls into a very similar category to the old business of uh, misusing the telephone system, it's stealing electricity, but I certainly know of no legislation which prohibits hacking as such. Most hackers uh, get their information from uh, meetings like in, in the local pub or at people's houses. They uh, swap useful information like phone numbers, passwords. If there's a phone number they've accidentally dialed up and not known how to get in or what it is, they'll make a concerted effort to try and break the system. I was trying to phone into the Prestel computer at Sheffield and I misstyled by one number and I got um, another computer coming up which uh, said Debenhams Interstall Communications. Please enter your password and account number. And what you do then, if you're any kind of hacker at all, is just start from the bottom and work up. And by a bit of experimenting, I found that the maximum number it would accept for an account was six numbers long, and the password was four numbers. So I started off at uh, 10,000 for the account, and it registered positive. It said I had a, a valid account number at 80,000. And the password that I then tried was 8,000, since it was fairly obvious. And uh, I went straight in with that. It allowed me in. Why, why didn't you get thrown off when you were having lots of attempts at it? 
You do get thrown off if you make three mistakes, but the way the Devlin system worked, it didn't actually turn the phone line off, it didn't put the phone down at it, it, its end. So you could just, you know, have another go. It said, um, sorry, you've made too many mistakes, please call again. But you could then just press a button and you went straight back in again. Once I got on, I was on at the top level, so I could go through the directory, find everyone's password and account number, and then log on as them and read their mail, and also send mail, pretending to be them. That was quite fun. So what, what kind of things did you do? Um, I sent a message from the system administrator to the director saying, uh, what, what do you think about system security? And he sent one back, which I intercepted, saying put a cork in it. <laughs> so they didn't take it seriously until I managed to find out how the program was written that the thing was running on. And I attacked the logout page, the page that says goodbye, thanks for calling, onto the login page. So as soon as anyone got in, it said, thanks for calling, please call again, and threw them out again. Uh, at that point, they said, do you want to phone us? So I did. And what happened then? Uh, they were very interested to know how I did it and what equipment I was using. So when I said I'm using a Spectrum, they didn't believe me. <laughs> they actually managed to convince them. Uh, obviously, they hadn't even thought about the possibility of people breaking in. And when they realised how much could be done by somebody who was in the system who shouldn't be, they tried to get all the information they could out of me about what, how I did it and could anyone else do it, how many people had I told. So have, have they now tightened their security as a result of that? Considerably, yes. They've, uh, you've now got one go to get in. If you don't, you're thrown off the system properly. And they record all accesses and all errors that are made. The, the security is now extremely tight on that system and it's not worth trying to get into now. Well, we contacted the two companies mentioned in that film and invited them to take part in a studio discussion. Debenhams, after originally confirming parts of the story, rang back to say that although they knew of the hacker, he'd only broken into a demonstration frame of their system. Now, that's rather strange, because we've seen a printout of a message that the Debenhams operator left for the hacker, asking him to contact them as they didn't know how he got onto the system and telling him that he would now be able to access less information than before, whatever that means. We've also seen printouts of lists of ID numbers and passwords from the chairman downwards, which seems rather a strange thing to put on a demonstration frame. Well, Demodems have declined to come along to the studio to discuss it further. However, John Clements from AGB is here. John, I gather the hacker we saw in the film only got on at a fairly low level of security. Yeah, I think a key point to make is that we do operate computer systems. We also operate a private view data system. And what he's showing there is accessing a private view data system. We have over 1,500 people across the country who have access to that system and have passwords. And so it's not exactly highly secure. Now, the point I would make is that the information you showed, for instance, the Granada Report stuff. Now, Granada Report is not secure. It's on-air polling we do for Granada. And the results that anything we do on Granada, anything available on those pages, are, in fact, broadcast on television in the Granada television area within three minutes of the data being collected. So there's not a lot of point making it secure when we're putting it out on television. What is the disadvantage of making it secure? The disadvantage of, I mean, basically it's rather like if BT wanted to cut out obscene phone calls, I guess they could abolish telephone directories and change everybody's number every day, but it wouldn't work too well as a communication system. Similarly, one's operating view data at a number of levels. We have a lot of non-classified information on the system, and this is available to people who dial up on the system and have a user number and password. They don't want to change their password every day, they don't want to have a complicated number. They just want to be able to come in, pick up the information. As long as it's non-classified, doesn't need to be secure, that's OK, because the information, frankly, is pretty boring for everybody else. Now, we do also carry classified information and secure information, like we have a lot of fish price information up on the system, which we charge people a lot of money for, and we don't particularly want people to access. Now, that is kept very secure, that, in fact, we regularly change the people's passwords who use that information, Sure, you might have a hacker come on and temporarily get some information there. But what we would do is weekly, we change the number, issue another number, so OK, you might for a short while, but that information is secure, not actually because the information is like doctor's records or bank accounts, but just because we managed to charge a lot of money for it and we don't want to give it away for nothing, actually. Well, many of you have got micros at home. We've already seen that. Um, how does hacking appeal to you? Hands up those people it rather appeals to. Ah, oh, there we go. And uh, would you be afraid to get caught? No. You wouldn't be afraid to get caught no. at all? What, what, would you, what, what would be the greatest challenge? What sort of company would you like to go into? 
I think a bank. A bank. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that's beautiful. What, is that to get money out of the bank? Would you like to uh, have 50 million transferred into your account in your name? Or, or no, what? just to show people that you, nothing's secure. So it's, it's really just for mischief. You want yeah. to do it for mischief. But it can be much more serious than that, can't it? What else would you like to get? Anybody else would like to get into it? Yeah. What would you like? Get into an examining board's computer and try and change grades for exams. <laughs> you, you'd no hesitation about cheating there. That wouldn't yeah. upset you. <laughs> You think that's quite reasonable to cheat in exams? If you can get into it, you've got the initiative. You deserve to get good grades. <laughs> 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 so none of you see anything wrong at all in hacking. And what about hacking, for example, Telecom Gold, as we got hacked in the last live show? Does anybody see anything wrong in that, of overhearing people or reading their private electronic mail? Nothing wrong with that? Well, we have somebody here from PT Gold. What would you do if you found somebody hacking BT Gold and could track them down? Well, the first thing, Mac, is that we would disable that mailbox so that the intruder couldn't create any more mischief than he's done already. And we'd get in touch with the, the owner of the mailbox and advise them that there's been an intruder and issue them a new one afresh. And meanwhile, you can, you can imagine we'd be taking a keen interest in what the, the hacker was up to and, and collecting any evidence as to who that person might be. But if you found him, could you sue him? I think it's something that hasn't yet been tested in court. It raises a number of is uh, interesting issues that are uh, rather analogous to the fraternity of schoolboys with fishing lines with sticky weights dipping through people's letterboxes trying to retrieve letters. And uh, certainly it could be a good game, but uh, the householders may take a different view of it. But the last one is clearly stealing, and there are laws against that. We'll be looking into the legal question much later on in the series, but th does anybody else have any feelings about what they would do if they found hackers into their accounts? I daren't ask anybody if they've ever hacked, but obviously you haven't. Do you know of people who haven't? What do they do? What do they go for? Yes? Well, really, if somebody hacks into your account, it's your own fault. Um, I don't really believe hacking's as easy as has been made out on that report. Um, <coughs> I know how secure my Prestel account is. And OK, if I were to change the passwords every week, I don't think anybody would get in. But I don't think anybody's ever got into my account, and I've never changed the password. Dick Sizer, do you have any uh, ideas what the law would do in a case like this? Um, I'm not quite sure what the law would do precisely, but the, um, the hacker who spoke on your film clip, in fact, was wrong on one point, one fundamental point. He obviously didn't appreciate that by hacking into a computer, he was using that computer resource uh, and occupying a port and therefore denying a legal uh, customer the right to get in. And certainly, I would have thought there was an offence there. Yes. Well, it does seem that the real answer lies with the users as well as the systems themselves. If you leave your front door open, don't be surprised if your umbrella gets stolen. When you use such a system, you've got to be aware of very simple passwords. For example, if your ID ends in 007, don't use the password bond. It's the first thing hackers will try. The real secret, of course, as we've heard already, is to change your password frequently. Now, if you've been listening to the radio late at night, you might have heard this. Well, that's the sound of a basic code program being transmitted by Radio Force Chip Shop. A basic code is an attempt to let you run the same piece of software on a range of different micros. It's been broadcast on Dutch television for some time and it was invented there. Ian, what are the problems that it meets up with and uh, how are they being solved? Well, Matt, we've got essentially three problems to cope with. Um, the first one is that different computers, we've got three here, um, have different methods of loading up cassette tape. So for instance, if you load a program up on the, on the Apple on the end there, it's going to load up the entire program from beginning to end. Um, whereas, for instance, on the, on the BBC one here, it loads it up in blocks of 256 bytes at a time. So it means, of course, if we try and to load a, um, an Apple tape on the BBC or the other way around, um, they're just not going to understand each other. So the way that Basic Code deals with that is on, you get on this um, tape here, um, a special cassette operating system for your individual computer and you load that into your computer and that overwrites um, the existing one and that means that different programs then can be loaded up from the same tape uh, onto the, these different computers. Well, this cassette costs £4. What exactly does it do for me? 
Well, it, it'll load in this operating system. That's the first thing. So you can then load, for instance, the same program. And we've got this program. To any of these machines. That's right. And we've got sort of a, a game here, um, uh, Donkey Kong, I think it's called here. Um, that's the first thing. So you can get the program in. Now, the second problem we have to solve, though, is the input and output routines. Um, different computers handle the input, the, the keyboards, for instance, and the output, the, the screen displays, the sounds, the graphics in different ways. And so um, the second thing basic code does, it loads into the top of every program that you load a set of subroutines. Shall we? Let's have a look. You list your one, um, and I'll list the top of my program here. And if we look on your screen, you can see at line 200, yes, 200 there. If peak 49152, and so on. Now, on the Apple, that is looking at the keyboard. Um, if we look at the, the same thing on here, line 200, we've got on the BBC um, in key string. Now, the idea here is that the program, which of course follows further down in the listing, can go sub 200, that is, call at the subroutine at line 200. When it gets on the Apple, it will uh, check the keyboard because that's the command for that. And when it works on the BBC, it also go to uh, line 200, but of course a different routine. Um, but it's going to have the same effect. You so imagine that, that would make the whole program run rather slow. It does because because it means then we can't use the, the necessarily the commands that are built into the system. We have to use a block of special commands, and it means keep going up to this subroutine block at the beginning of the program. And that, in fact, is tied up with the third problem, um, which is that there are different forms of BASIC um, on each computer. It's a terrible problem with, with microcomputers, all the different forms of BASIC. And for instance, we've got on the Apple about 100 odd commands here, 75 different BASIC commands on the VIC-20, and 150 something like that on the BBC. And clearly, if you use those commands uh, from on different machines, the program won't work. So BASIC code takes a really sort of a hatchet job on this. It simply says, well, we'll let you use 50 commands and no more. And, um, so it's rather like a basic English. You can express ideas, but it must be a lot harder than in English. Oh, it makes programming well. very much more difficult because you've got to, uh, and the, the program gets much longer and much more difficult to debug. And of course, you can't use all the, all the features of the good machines, you know, the graphics what and the of, sound and the color. What sort of uh, programs are being transmitted? Well, this is an experiment at the moment, and I've looked at some of these programs, quite frankly, <laughs> um, that they're really pretty poor. Um, and I think at this stage, you know, it is an experiment and it's a bit of fun. Um, but so um, summing up, does it get oh, your thumbs up? I'm afraid, up or as, a, as a contribution to computer literacy, really hands down, thumbs down. Well, it doesn't look as if that's very good. One thing you can't do with basic code is produce high resolution graphics. Well, here we have a number nine board, which Fref talked about earlier. It enables Apple owners to create just that. Here in Manhattan's East Village, one of New York's more colorful neighborhoods, right next to the police station where they filmed exteriors for Kojak and Cagney and Lacey, commercial artist Loretta Jones is plying an old trade with a new twist. She does all her work on computer. Well, I'm an illustrator like any other illustrator, except that my uh, medium, instead of being watercolor or airbrush, is the computer. I do illustrations for magazines, uh, for promotional materials, uh, any print media and also for software. Now this new board gives you much greater resolution. Perhaps you could show us something so that we could see the difference between the old style and the new style that you're working with. I've loaded in an image that I drew in normal Apple graphics. Uh, it's an Etch-a-Sketch. It's an image that I've used repeatedly in various projects. Um, and then on the inside, on the Etch-a-Sketch screen, I've drawn a quarter of a self-portrait with the number nine board. Uh, I love the contrast of the high res and, and the various colors next to the crudeness, almost woodcut quality that the basic Apple graphics has. As I understand it, the board is capable of much greater resolutions. Why stop at only 512 by 512? Once you get much past 512, you can't tell that it was drawn with a computer. And to me, that quality is part of what I want in my drawing. That's what's interesting and exciting to me. Something like the way watercolor has its own texture and woodcuts have their own texture. 
computer art has to have a certain feel for you. For me, once you satisfied. yeah, once you get beyond that, it could be anything. It could be a drawing that you did in another room and and took a picture of with a video camera. It's not intrinsically a computer image any longer. Well, now let's see what you do with it. Well, basically, I have this tablet and a stylus, which has a click switch in the tip, and I'm working with a menu on one screen and the image on another screen. And the control that the pen gives me is transferred back and forth as I need it. So say I want to draw some smoke coming off the end of the cigarette. I would move around on the menu and find the airbrush function, press down, and now control is switched to the screen. To choose my colors, I have a palette that's hidden off the bottom of the screen. And I have a circle that defines the airbrush area. I've chosen the green color for the smoke, a dark green. And it choose the size of the airbrush area. And then by pressing down. Oh, my. So you can create a very misty effect. Right, and go Actual over smoke. and over. It's, it's pretty close to a spray effect or an airbrush effect. And get some highlights, denser areas right. by going over it. Now, in order to get one of these images into print, I have gotten myself a nice brand new Lang video slide camera. And you can see it's got a 35 millimeter camera mounted on the outside. Inside is a teeny weeny little black and white high res screen and a series of color filters in front of the camera. It's hooked up into the computer and it's automatically does a triple exposure and you come out with just regular 35 millimeter film. So while the film stays still in here, the black and white monitor screen is giving you first the red, then the green, then the blue, independently of one another, breaks the picture down yes. and it's recombined onto film through the filters. Right. That's the tool you use. Now, could you show us some of the work you've done with it? One half of my work, I would say, is printed pieces. And that's a magazine cover. This is a magazine cover, an annual report cover. And inside of this annual report are various initial caps that were dropped into the body copy. Kind of a modern typography yeah. trick, that. This is great fun. Oh, now, a lot of us feel about microcomputers just that. And here's an example of combining it with a photographer that I work with, combine the two images. Very impressed with that. One thing that's kept me very busy, this is a bi-monthly magazine on disc that this educational publisher, Scholastic, has put out. That's a very strangely shaped box, Loretta. Yes, I love this. <laughs> Trapezoid. And... With a strangely shaped booklet to match, little, all right. And okay, disc. but a normal shaped disc. I see. And they have various programs on here, educational programs, teach the kids programming and, and various concepts. And you illustrate these? There's stories on here, Story. branching stories. And this is what I've been illustrating. Each one has a title page and then about 12 to 15 illustrations per story. Title page has some animation in it. It's a branching story, a classic, like a classic adventure story where you do what you choose at certain points determines the course of the story. And you can go through it many times and have different things happen. And my pictures are all sort of scattered and hidden throughout the story. OK, now we're in the micro zone. And this is one of my illustrations showing the dilemma that you're now in. Quite hypnotic, that. And the plot of the story essentially is that you hit the wrong key on your computer Saturday morning while mom and dad are gone, and you get shrunk down to about two or two and a half inches high. And you can't reach the key to change back, of course. No, you're on the adventure trying to find the manual to figure out how to remedy the situation. So you could look in your grandfather's workshop to find the manual if you can find your way up to his desk. I see. Do you mind if I get personal for a moment? Possibly. Now, there are those who think that women don't really know much about micros or aren't very interested in micros. How do you feel about that? I don't know that to be true. I mean, I've heard it too, but I know a lot of women involved with computers, especially in computers and computer graphics. Um, but if it is true, I think the girls are missing out on a lot of fun. So you don't think the micros are strictly for men? I think that is one of the silliest things I've ever heard. Well, now to our software competition, the moment our finalists have all been waiting for. The competition was organised with the help from the Microelectronics Education Programme and its Scottish equivalent, 
15 regional winners were chosen and they're all here in the studio today. The judging for the overall national winners from these 15 took place recently in Glasgow and the judges were faced with an almost impossible task. The Glasgow headquarters of the Scottish Microelectronics Development Programme and the judges had a day to judge the software from the 15 regions. This involved not only examining the way the programs work and how easy and foolproof they are to use, but balancing up their originality, usefulness and the quality of their presentation, not just on the screen, but on the paperwork that goes with them. By chance, the two teams using RML machines both submitted programs to help with school timetabling. This one included a security procedure to discourage the casual hacker. Some of the judges were surprised that students had set themselves such a complex task. Though unspectacular looking, these programs contained a good deal of complex programming for handling data. But most programs related to school subjects closer to the heart, or in this case, the stomach. It's a diet program to check the nutritional content of, say, school dinners. One of the judges, John MacDonald, is a schools inspector. They've been amazed by the quality and the range of applications that have been uh, presented in, in the entries. Uh, we've now reached the final 15 and it's going to be an extremely difficult job to, to sort out the three winners, but it will be very interesting. Two schools produce packages for eye-catching public notice boards with a range of easily created teletext-like graphics. On this one, specimen displays range from messages from the headmaster to the electronic equivalent of the personal column. Well, can show hidden detail? Well, you can show yes. hidden detail, but you're not on the right angle, because we're limited to six angles. Uh, Testing any program properly is a daunting task if you're going to do it justice, especially with something complex like a technical drawing program. Incidentally, the judges didn't know where any of the software had come from or how old the software writers were. Right, let's save it and then record it. Oh, I see. OK. Um, no, I don't think we need to do that. Let's see if it assumes that, because it's the logical thing for it to do. And that would but the four judges were helped by further. professional programmers who'd made it their business to learn thoroughly about a number of entries in advance. Double notes. Three at a time. Not. Four at a time. Full range of the keyboard. From a synthesizer to a different music program. This time for composing, editing and printing it out. A musical version of the word processor. Maybe the teams producing these two entries should get together to produce a complete system. Now we've reached this stage, it really is very difficult indeed. The programmes work in a number of different areas and it's so difficult to decide to weigh up the merits of one against the merits of another. It's a bit like deciding what's the better, a Rolls Royce or a racehorse. It depends what you want them for. If you want to win the Grand National, it's not much use having a Rolls Royce. Well, yes, but what we've really got to look for is the different types of quality. There's technical quality and there's the quality of innovation, the excitement. And even people like ourselves, who've been in this business for many years, are rather excited at some of the software, which is really going to make our job very difficult indeed. It's easy to see the judge's dilemma. This graph drawing program had an elegant visual display, but it attempted a relatively simple problem. Yet any math teacher would find it useful, just as a physics teacher would find this temperature plotting routine valuable. But how do you judge the relative merits of these against, say, a simulation of electronic logic gates, or any of the other programs for that matter? Unfortunately, only one finalist used the computer as a control device, maybe because of the problems of producing suitable safe hardware. It's designed to control a bank of stage or disco lights. 
and there was only one game. This one, written by two 14-year-olds, is aimed to help mentally retarded children understand a simple task, to move a figure across the screen. One important thing they'd done is tried it out with people it was designed to help, a bit of the rigorous field testing most programs could do with, but so often lack. <coughs> And so to the final stage, the battle to produce a unanimous verdict from all those different personal assessments. Fortunately, any blood that was shed was behind closed doors. Well, I've been joined by Richard Fothergill, one of the judges, and Bill Cotton, the managing director of BBC Television. Welcome, gentlemen. Can we start and look at who's won the prizes? Yes, certainly. Um, before I open them, I'd just like to say that, I mean, apart from the fact that... Uh, uh, all these, this computer is fascinating and fun, and as we've seen from these programs, we, you know, we at the BBC are delighted that um, uh, we've been in the forefront of, of, of this uh, computer, not only with the uh, micro-literacy, but um, also with the hardware, with the, micro, with the BBC microcomputer. Uh, the Charter, as you, many of you will know, um, encourages us to educate, inform and entertain. And to me, these com this whole computer setup really does all, all of it. I mean, it is not only very, very good in the area of education, but it's wonderful for information. And as you see, you get an enormous amount of entertainment out of it. I must admit, I'm absolutely intrigued with this hacker lark. Somewhere on a computer has got to be the ITV's autumn schedule. <laughs> <laughs> now, where do I get it? <laughs> Somewhere no, inside you, there's a hacker trying to get out. <laughs> <laughs> let's have a look and see now. This is the third prize, isn't it? Hold on a minute. I've always watched people do this on television, and I've always misunderstood why they don't do it as well. Third prize goes to the Blue Coat School at Oldham for their technical drawing programme. <laughs> How long did that all take? Oh, about six months. About six months? Yes. Oh, well, very good. I hope that'll hang somewhere nicely in the school. Yes, thank you. Well done. <laughs> well done, Blue Coat School, and let's have a look at their software. This is a subject that's uh, absolutely ripe for use by, uh, the, by schools. Uh, it's a subject which we've found a great deal of number of schools need to see because it's being used by industry and commerce, technical drawing, with a computer. And the great thing about this program is that you can enter your drawings like this, and then you can alter and look at it from different projections. And being able to switch from one projection to another is extremely helpful. Around the screen, too, you will see lots of information, which gives you a clear idea as to where you are in the program, and that's a very important use of layout. Also, you can magnify a small section and then alter it to fit your needs. Very good program indeed. Very nice drawing. Well done. Well, can we look at the second prize? Certainly. Here we go. Someone stuck these down very well. It just shows nobody knows it yet. Ah, yes, it's a joint first prize, um, and it goes to the Drayton Manor High School, London, for their school timetabling programme. pupils as well. Every school needs administration. It's not a very original subject area, but an extraordinarily valuable one for schools. And as you can see, teachers will be immensely satisfied with this particular program. It's well designed, good menus so that you can go through it, good e easy ability to alter it, to amend it and update it. And what we are very impressed with was the quality of the documentation, something that so many schools and so many of these entries lack. Very good documentation indeed. In fact, much British software fails because of the lousy quality of the documentation. Indeed it does. Mm. And of course, each pupil gets a printout of their own program, of their own timetable. Excellent, Excellent programme. Excellent. Well done. Let's have a look at the first prize. Or oh, the joint first prize. Joint, yes, first. joint first prize. Hold on a minute. <laughs> joint first prize goes to the William Howard School, Brampton, for their music score writing programme. Congratulations. Thank you. Would you like to 
take us through that, Richard? Yes. Well, here's a program that will answer many of a music teacher's problems. You can type in the score on your score, as you can see on the screen now. It automatically puts in bars. And what's very original about this is the bottom line where you can actually invent and design your own graphics, which become the ornaments on, around the music. And that, of course, gets printed out as well. Also, you can put in the words. So it's not just a music processor, it's a word processor as well. So you can actually add the dialogue or whatever you sing, if there are any words, alongside the music as well, and a very fine printout. It's uh, ideal for all schools to be able to distribute music to children. Do you think they're good enough quality to be actually used in anger throughout schools? Well, a number of them are being used in schools really? at this moment, and I would have thought that with a little bit more time working on some of them, in particular, I think we gave them a very short time to debug them completely, and they need a little bit of work on that. But once that is, many of these programs, and there are many better, because good ones outside too that didn't win, uh, many of these programs could be widely used and sold commercially. Can I ask the question, would they get paid for them? Oh, well, I think so, yes. I mean, there's absolutely no reason why many of these shouldn't be used commercially. And, so well, the boys so keep, the keep some sort of royalty, some well, of copyright? The school, or the boys, depending on the local authorities and all that sort of thing. <laughs> That's their problem. <laughs> Bill, apart from being managing director of television, you're also chairman of BBC Enterprises. And a question I've always wanted to ask you, do you think it's been a good idea to take the BBC into computer hardware and all that desperate market out there? Oh, yes. Um, uh, as you probably know, the thing started as, as a support for the, for the programmes. I mean, that it, it was the whole proposition was driven by us wishing to get a, a, a computer the, for, around which we could build programmes. It also had a rather ni nice effect on the side of making us something in the region of five to six million pounds out of royalties, which uh, one way and the other we can always uh, do with uh, to enhance our programs. But uh, no, I think um, what I found fascinating in talking to people in the world of computing was that um, the, uh, the BBC name, if you like, has been enormously helpful in terms of giving people confidence that the, that the um, machine is going to be well uh, constructed, that it is going to be intelligently marketed, and, um, and I think it'll go from strength, to, uh, from strength to strength. And I think it's always good if you're going to do, uh, get into an area like this, to have more than, a, more than just a little stake in it. It keeps us all on our toes. How many, uh, in the competition, how many were on which machines? Were the majority on BBC? The majority were on BBC machines, but there were quite a number on RML as well, mm -hmm. and the two main ones in school. Were many of the other thing, uh, other entries, were the graphic programmes? Was that, that was yes, I mean, some of the ones you saw in, uh, illustrated in yes. the insert earlier yeah. which showed a lot, you know, a lot of use of graphics. What I think has been very impressive has been the very great care that had been taken with layout. We've got, uh, I mean, early programs in the computers were really terrible on the layout side, ghastly capital letters everywhere and close up against each other. A lot more concern has been made on layout and consideration of use of colour and intelligent balance on the screen. Thank you, Bill. Thank you, Richard. Thank you. Well, many congratulations to all the winners and well done everybody who took part in the competition. And thank you, Richard and Bill. It's almost time for us to finish, but just before we go, I'd like to remind you again of our new series later on this year. If you have any ideas of things you'd like to see, you can send a message to us by Telecom Gold to BBC 100, or you can look at Micronet page 800 11302. By the way, if you go through BT Gold, it is System 81. Or if you're deep into low technology, you can actually write to us at the address at the end of this program. Shame. And you can also write to that address for an information sheet on today's program. And that includes the names of our 15 finalists here and details of their software. And just before we go, I'd like to read you a letter we received after the last program. She complained that we overran and we didn't have give her time to cook her lunch. And also, when I said have a good lunch, she was out there cooking. So, goodbye. <laughs>